have a great middle child story from Full House. There's an episode in Full House where Jesse and Becky are moving out of the house. Okay. When Jesse moved into the house, he moved into Stephanie's old bedroom. Correct. With the pink bunnies. Now, the pink bunnies were supposedly hand cut by Pamela, Stephanie's mom, Jesse's sister. Right. Michelle gives Jesse the pink bunny or vice versa. Something happened. And I was like, wow. But th- those are not. <laughs> I actually know what it's like, like to, to be, be a little child. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. My and Bialik's breakdown is supported by Third Love. Jonathan, I have news for you. Tell me. There's a bra that makes me look and feel amazing, and it's actually super comfortable all day. It's very exciting. I wanted you to know that. It is very exciting. And I'm not just telling you, I'm telling everyone. Most bras suck. Like, it's just like a thing. We're just like, as women, we just are told, <laughs> your bra's experience is going to be horrible. It's um, it's horrible. But Third Love knows that it's not you. It's the bra. Third Love spent years designing bras for your body. They make over 60 sizes, and they even invented half cups. Like, that helps you have the perfect fit which means you'll always look and feel great. I've owned every bad bra there is. The kind that the straps don't stay on, my breasts are falling out the sides, it's digging in, it's giving me a rash, like it is runs out of elastic after one wearing. I've had all of the bad bras, but I love this bra. Let's ditch bad bras, please, and get a better one that makes you look and feel great. Upgrade your bra and get 20% off your first order at thirdlove.com slash breakdown. That's 20% off your first order today at thirdlove.com slash breakdown. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. Today, we are going to talk about so many things. And actually, this is an episode where I, I have some aha moments. And I'm a person who I don't like to think I know everything, but it's kind of hard to shake the foundation of a lot of things that I've explored a lot, particularly in therapy. And we have someone today who really kind of shook things up for me. Um, we're going to be welcoming Jody Sweeten, that's Stephanie Tanner, on Full House and Fuller House. But first, the person who shakes things up for me on the daily, Jonathan Cohen. Hello. Hello, Mime. You have a lot to discover still. You don't have it all figured out. That's okay. Jonathan, you're coming to us today from your studio at the border of Oregon and California. Is that correct? That's true. Here I am again. And um, did they have Full House in Canada? I'm going to admit it. I was a big Full House fan. I like that really? show. I watched it as a kid. Did you yeah. say, look at those it, funny Americans. They're so funny. No, I was. I liked the intro credit sequence. And I'm like, this is a pleasant little town. I didn't know it was San Francisco <laughs> at the time. I like the music. Everywhere you go. Da, 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 we're in San Francisco. Hey, hold on to. Yeah. That's burned in there. We talk about many things with Jody Sweeten. I hope that this is kind of a different lens with which to look at her. She talks a lot about, obviously, her work on um, Full House and what it was like essentially growing up in the industry literally from the time, like almost as early as she can remember. She was on that show and working. She shares very intimately um, her... Uh, her story, she was adopted as a baby. She talks a lot about that transition in her life, what she's learned in therapy, about the times that she may not even necessarily consciously remember. She doesn't just talk the talk. She um, she walks the walk. And I really have a, a tremendous amount of, of respect for her. And I learned a lot. This is a very interesting one. I, I got some new perspective on my experience in my life that um, I don't think I've had before. I also do want to mention that she recently was in two holiday films. She works a lot. Merry Swissmas on Lifetime at a cozy Christmas Inn on the Hallmark Channel. That's right. 
This is someone who makes movies both on Lifetime and the Hallmark Channel. She's executive producing and starring in the rom-com Just Swipe. She just wrapped production on Craft Me a Romance out later in the year. Um, she has a podcast, Never Thought I'd Say This. She's also been a recurring guest co-host on The Talk and Ease Daily Pop regularly. Honestly, I think we got a taste of why that is today. You know what I like about Jody? What do you like about Jody Sweeten? She checks in on me. She really checks in on me in this episode. And, you know, I got to say, I didn't hate it. You know, Jonathan, I happen to think that I check in on you plenty, but I'm very glad that you felt taken care of uh, by Jody. I did. <laughs> she also wrote a memoir, Unsweetened. She's an activist in many, many areas. She's a mom of two, and it's really, really a pleasure to welcome to The Breakdown here in person with Jonathan on a screen, Jody Sweeten. Break it down. Jody, welcome to the breakdown. And Wait, thank you. It's very exciting to sit with you because, first of all, you look amazing and Wait, you look you. like you're still a teenager. I appreciate that. Which is how I, you know, I still sort of, I mean, I know you get this a lot and um, you still, you I look. I was on TV. I know, but you I look know. amazing. No, okay. just... So. <laughs> So that, and you know, we we recently had Candace Cameron. I can't remember how to pronounce her last name. Beret. Beret. Yes. We recently had Candace Cameron Beret on, <laughs> and people just love this era. People love Full House. Like, so it's actually, it's really fun to have you on here. And I don't want to say that I've been wanting to speak to you even before I wanted to speak to her, but you know, I've followed so much of your life and your journey and was just very excited to get to talk to you. Thank you. Also, as I mentioned to Candace, my first audition ever was to play DJ in Full House. Really? Yes, and I know you're like doing the math. That's so amazing. I'm 47. I started acting when I was 11 and that was the first audition I went on. Oh, and wow. You had been acting long before 11, but I had just started acting at 11. What are some of the common notes that casting directors will give feedback to an agent about? Either, it's usually either one of two things. Either they're overly theatrical and they need to tone it down and they're like playing it like to the back of the theater. Okay, or, and, or, or they go in and just don't really, they're just kind of really shy and Okay, so and I already am more different than you thought. Okay, okay. Just, well, I just feel like that's oftentimes, you know, 100%. like kids are like, I love this. And then you send them into an audition and they're like. <gasps> no, no, no. I, okay. um, just rushing, just speaking way too oh, fast. Oh God, oh, I, story of my life. I get it today. Yeah. Still, that's, yeah, no. So that was the note. Um, also. I don't, I, I'm gonna, I'm even gonna venture to say something. I'm gonna. I was too to good say, for the part, and I was meant part. for other no, things. No, that that I think uh, I know. For me, my brain works five thousand miles an hour, and I have a feeling yours might as well. Yes, and I feel like sometimes that's why we talk really fast. Because I'm like, if I don't talk fast yes. and get all of this out quickly. <laughs> I'm going to distract myself. Well, it's part, it's, it's part <laughs> I'm of- I'm going to lose interest. It's part of my delicate psychiatric profile, which I think is very charming. Girl, it, but... is, par I have, it is part of my charm now. At nearly 41, <laughs> it, it's, I've incorporated it to be charming. Um, but- by the, It's nice to be invited to someone else's breakdown, by the oh, way. Oh, yes. yes. And not Always. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our breakdown. Yes, exactly. Where you get to share um, things that are not currently breaking down for you, <laughs> while we just share our current breakdowns. No, but the other thing I was going to say is that, you know, a funny thing happened. On the when way to I, the forum? <laughs> pretty much. A funny thing happened, you know, when I started acting in 1986. Um, you know, I I looked pretty much then like I do now, meaning like I had prominent features. You know, I had like a whatever. This is my face. And, you know, I remember when I told my parents I, I wanted. I love your face. Thank you. It's an awesome. I'm growing face. to love it. Really? Um, I lo see. I love. I love unique faces. Thank I you. like faces it with is like unique. Yeah. I no, but I mean like faces that character. Have, like, I've got character. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, I, in 1986, though, you can imagine that when I said to my parents, "I want to be an actress," like they looked at the television and looked at me and looked, and they must have been like, "What does she think she's right. gonna do?" Because this, like, 
ethnic features were right. not popular in the 80s. And I had blonde hair and blue eyes. I could have been your sister, but from another mister. No, so no, I don't think so. I think actually from the mister that we were supposed to have all been from may have, like, I'm just I look, saying. I look more like the late beloved Bob Saget than <laughs> any of you. <laughs> I'm not, and I don't mean this, but. He was from my tribe. Yes, like, right. Yes. In any event. Um, you know, obviously that show and the cast that was put together, you know, became such an iconic part, you know, of, yes. of so many lives and also the lives of the actual humans like yes. you who were who were living it. Um, and, you know, and also just with the resurgence, you know, and with Fuller House, which actually I think films right next to Call Me Cat. Um, I also work at Warner Brothers. Oh. Um, so it's just been um, like, gosh, what a fascinating, you know, kind of book ending of your life i mean For you sure. were a little one i was when you started i was, I was uh, 4 years old when i started working in the business i started doing commercials and things like that um and i was like four a little over four and a half when i did my first television appearance on valerie um wow. which was uh, the valerie harper show yeah and then uh and then i got cast from doing that on the full house at like barely 5 so what what do you remember of being that like do you because I barely remember things like I was in I did square dancing in kindergarten when I was four. So like I remember some things, but like how much do you remember kind of of that period of your life? I you know, I mean, I think oftentimes what we remember, we have flashes of what we remember and we also have lots of flashes of what our photographs tell us. Right. And luckily that was a pretty well documented period of my life. Uh, so I have like these really great reference points to be like, oh yeah, 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 I remember that. Or like these pictures either that, you know, were behind the scenes that my mom took or whatever right. behind the scenes, you know, video and John Stamos took tons and tons wow. of video. So we've got all this video of growing up. Like I actually am fortunate cause I, I not only remember it fairly well, but I have all of these reference points to like trigger those memories. So it was, I mean, I don't remember much of my life before being on Full right, House. Right, which most of us, you know, likely don't. I mean, it's right, like the prior beginnings Right, to five of, years old. I mean, right. most of us are like, I don't know. <laughs> so um, I imagine that, you know, you spent those kind of formative elementary school years mm -hmm. and really into your junior high years. Yeah, all through you know, middle school. It wasn't working. until uh, I started high school that I was going to school full time. Wow. So what, gosh, what was education like for you? Because, like, again, I started working regularly, you know, when I was 14, which is, right. like, a very different phase of life. Like, right. you have different tutors for subjects, and it's, like, you're in Algebra 2, and, like, there's a lot to, like, hold on to. Right. But, you know, you had to kind of, like, learn all the basic stuff that happens in elementary school, like, in a very different environment. Y yes and no. I, You know, it's I was really fortunate um, when – so the first season of – Full House. I was five years old. I had just started kindergarten. Now I was in kindergarten for about three days and and got moved out and tested out of kindergarten. Um, <laughs> You're like, peace out, peace out. <laughs> See you later. No, and and um, they they were gonna move me to second, but moving to first grade. So they moved me to first grade, and I. So you were. Cautious. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. I mean, like and I don't some, say that. It's like that. I, that sounds like I'm no, bragging. No, no, but I, I skipped kindergarten. The finger painting. You know no, what I mean? The big stuff. No, but something about you, because like whatever. My brother skipped second grade. Like, but yes. there was something about you at that age where they were like, not, yeah. Like, I was yeah. reading by the time Got I it. was before I was four. I could pick up most any book and read it. I you know was had a. I I I was yes precocious is a good way to put it. Uh, so I started first grade, and I was doing. Full House, and that first season, I think like the first season and a half, it was the usual sitcom work schedule. It was right. five days a week, work three weeks, off, off one, one week. Day. So the weeks I was off, I would go to right. regular school, and then I would be tutored on set because we were kind of still, you know, figuring it out. By the time I want to say the second, second or third season rolled around, um, maybe even... Yeah, about third season, I was able to go to school in the morning, and yeah. then my mom would pick me up because I lived in Orange County back in the days when you could make it from Orange County to L.A. in <laughs> under an hour, you know, it was just, oh, so very long ago. Um, and my mom would pick me up from school at lunch. I'd work on my script in the car. 
I'd come to work and I'd rehearse and stuff in the afternoon. And then Thursdays and Fridays were like uh, block and shoot and right. audience tape days. And then those days I would be exclusively on set because we had to go later. So I would have to start. And that was later. just normal for you. Like it was yeah. just like I go to school and this is my after school thing I do. I would do that. I got used to like traveling on weekends and doing, you know, um, homework in the car or you know on set or like banking three hours you know so you could the next day you wouldn't have to do as much school or whatever um but I think honestly for the way my brain works um having gotten diagnosed with ADHD later in life I I have found that looking at all of those ways that I grew up I think were actually it was like the perfect environment for someone like me because I was constantly stimulated right and doing something different and learning something new and balancing three or four different things and going in different directions so right. yeah I think if anything that was it was like the best place for my brain to flourish Mind the Alex Breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. We use Athletic Greens every day we started taking Athletic Greens mostly because Jonathan was tired of me complaining about the thousands and millions of pills I had to take to get all those holes in my diet filled in. What's Athletic Greens? Well, one delicious scoop has 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start our day right. One of the reasons I love Athletic Greens, besides the fact that it takes the place of 8,000 million hundred pills, is that it is lifestyle friendly. So I happen to be vegan, but if you're vegan, paleo, keto, maybe you're just dairy-free, maybe you're gluten-free, maybe you're watching your sugar, well, this is for you. Right now, we are encouraging you to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Jonathan, how do you take it? Is it 8,000 scoops? Just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills or supplements. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. That's athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Rocket Money. I like saying rocket money. Rocket Rocket money. money. If your New Year's goals are to manage your budget better and to save money, you need rocket money. Say goodbye to last year's outdated, disorganized methods of managing your money and say hello to... Rocket money. The better way to hack your finances in 2023. Rocket money was formerly known as Truebill, and what it is is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place, and it works. Over 80 percent of people have subscriptions that they just forget about like that streaming service that you bought to watch that one show we like, literally did that last we night. literally <laughs> did that last night or that free trial that you never even used oh that has happened to me so many times rocket money will quickly and easily identify subscriptions for you so you can stop paying for the ones that you don't even want anymore Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash breakdown. That's rocketmoney.com slash breakdown. Rocketmoney.com slash breakdown. Mind Alex Breakdown is supported by Nom Nom. Your pet is a member of the family, so don't feed them like they're in the doghouse. Give them Nom Nom. Nom Nom delivers fresh dog food with every portion personalized to your dog's needs so you can bring out their best. Nom Nom is made with real whole food that you can see and recognize without any additives or fillers that contribute to bloating or low energy. That's because Nom Nom uses the latest science and insight to make real good food for dogs. Their nutrient-packed recipes are crafted by board-certified veterinary nutritionists. They're made fresh and they're shipped free to your door our fantastic assistant Alyssa her dog Chad who is adorable loves it so much he literally runs to the freezer every time they open it Chad seems more full that means everyone's happier in the house and Chad is stealing Alyssa's human baby food less, which is a real win. Alyssa's parents also switched to Nom Nom for their dog who has acid reflux, and it has helped him so much. Nom Nom starts at around $2.40 a meal and comes with a money-back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. What made you initially be like, maybe I should explore this as a potential diagnosis or label? My girls were struggling with it. And I was reading more and more about 
girls and how ADHD affects them. And it I was looks going, different oh, than in boys. It looks very different. Tell it us looks, a little bit about what you learned. Um, it looks like talking a lot. It looks like not being able to shut up in class. And let me tell you, that was the number one thing I got in trouble for. Like name on the board Same? every day. Teachers hated me, but they loved me. But they were like, she can't. I don't physically think she can stop talking. Wow. And I was like, I can't. <laughs> I can't right now. Yeah. It's good for right. podcast hosts. Yeah. Terrible. You know what? It's true. You're going to be in town tomorrow, and I'm going to give you the what for about that comment. <laughs> What? It's a positive. So I just had a friend of mine, 65 years old, just recently talk and realize that she had ADHD. And now she's looking back at her entire life wondering like, oh my gosh, so many things don't make sense. Don't talk about me when I'm right and in the room, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look a day over 64. And, <laughs> and, and then also the flip side was she was asking like, okay, now that I have that, like, how do I know what my superpowers are? Because it does come with extra abilities in certain areas. For sure. Um, the one thing that drove me a little bit crazy about realizing that Mayim has as much or more ADHD <laughs> than I do is that she used to get annoyed with me for like, you're not focused, you're doing too many things, but really... It was that she needs me to just be like this totally still because it distracts her. They're right. That's the that's the problem. Put two ADHD <laughs> people in a room together and watch 17 things not get done simultaneously. <laughs> but no, I, you know. Or if you can channel it. Well, that's the thing is my area. What I realized is, it, you know, people on set would, I mean, you would not know it. Even now, like I've moved into directing and I've done, I can keep. 9,000 plates spinning right. in my head That's on a set. I, I know what hand I picked up what with. Like, I know where something was. I, like, every single detail I can remember as an actor and or director. I get home, I can't find my keys. And w what I realized is, is most people with ADHD have an area of hyper-focus. Right. Mine is what I love to do, which is perform right. and be on set. And so the reason I never feel more at home than when I do on set is one, because I literally grew up there from the age of four, and two, because it's the area where my brain is like, yes, I'm in, like I'm in the place where I thrive. So um, I think, you know, it's interesting to go along and learn these things about yourself and kind of go back and piece things together. And you get to give yourself a little break and go, oh, I didn't know that then. So I felt like my something was wrong with me because I didn't have it figured out until now. Mime, I've heard you describe something similar, the way you break down a script, the way you know where everyone is supposed to be in a scene, the way that like and everything tracks and you're tracking every part and it's all making sense to you, like that level of diligence and focus definitely comes out. And I've seen you, you know, talk about directing and be in the same zone where you're just like, it just all is like clear to you. Well, I mean, I think, look, I, I can't speak for you or for you. You know, for me, there's a there's also a real safety in that level of vigilance about details because it means that the focus is anywhere but on me. Like, I don't I don't really have to like, do I have to pee? Do I have to eat? It doesn't matter. Right, like, right. I'm just oh, like, yeah, what is I'm dialed into, you know, everything right. else. So it really is. It's I mean, in some ways, I think it's a like, you know, it's compensating for something. It's like a de, right. it's like I'm, a defense. It is right. Look, you pull the thread of this sweater and it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the whole thing's going to unravel. Yeah. But, but it is. It's it's part of so much of what makes us really good at right. what we do. Yeah. And then in other areas be like, oh, my God, did I I don't. Did right. I take my meds this morning? No, I what day um, is it? <laughs> I for most of my adult life, I've had a bell on my keys and on my wallet because I lose them all the time. So at least I know to like jingle jangle every jacket because it's almost, almost always yep. like somewhere like that. One of the biggest misunderstandings that we had was when you were writing your script and rewriting your script, you were in like the later phases of uh, the redrafts. And when she, like, we would talk about a note and then she would be like, got it. Okay, I'm going to sit and write, rewrite this scene. And then we weren't in the same room. We were hanging out over Zoom. And then I would go and start scrolling 
and that scrolling would be distracting her. So she wanted me to just sit and just watch wait. her. I'm a very quick writer. Scene. A very quick writer. But like that was agony for me. Like I'm that like, would, I'm yeah, I could, to... I'd, I'd be dead. I'd be dead. <laughs> yeah, would, yeah, that'd be a lot. Also, I love how we have sidetracked this conversation into a full ADHD plot. Well, not really sidetracked. An ADHD just... episode. <laughs> when I think about also your like full house life. And then your Fuller House life. And I didn't mean to say like it's book ended because you have a long life and career ahead of you. But I, I wonder, I know you've been asked so many things about so many aspects of Full House and Fuller House. So I'm trying to like find different ways to yeah. like talk about things that maybe you haven't, you know, maybe explored the same way. And one of the things I was thinking about is what are sort of your reflections that like kind of, you know, this very early moment of your career mm -hmm was essentially, you know, um, rebooted, you know, right. so many decades later. Like, what is that? Obviously, it speaks to the the popularity of the show and the interest, but kind of personally, like, it, I, I would imagine it must be so interesting to, like, you're playing, you know, you get to have a character grow up. Right. So what is that like as an actor, like, to get to, you know, have a character grow up? And you don't see all those years in between, but right. you're what happened after this whole time has been off. Right. I mean, you know, I I was always really excited to get to come and bring Stephanie sort of back to life. Um, Stephanie was such a fun character to play as a kid. And, you know, it's, it's so weird because I don't know. Oftentimes I feel like I don't know sort of where Steph ends and I began. Like we have this very blurred self. I mean, I'm very clear that I am not Stephanie. Uh, but I <laughs> no, but I get what. <laughs> but you, you know mean. what I mean. Like I, it, it's your we voice. Were it's so, your face. As a kid, they they really used so much of who I was to inform who Stephanie was, right. and who Stephanie was was this kind of amplified version of who I was. So it it, yeah. it it, I liked her. I liked being her, and and that made me I think like me because it was you know these things and this person that I sort of was anyway so getting to come back and play that person decades later um and have Steph have you know I, I, like I gave Steph some backstory you know yes it was a sitcom and it's whatever but no, I was like but, what yeah. happened to Steph in between like you know why was Steph kind of away from her family for a while like what mm. you know Steph kind of went and did her own thing and like this is hard for her to come back to and you know this adjustment and all of this kind of what's stuff. what's the craziest part of her backstory that you gave her in your head like did she join the circus for a minute i mean steph lit steph basically it's in in a way she was you know djing in europe like she basically i i feel like steph got it like moved to Europe probably for a dude or a relationship right. and the guy like some 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 idiot guy and like did he give her ecstasy at a party and he told her water would taste Smoothie good or something like that <laughs> or like he or or he was just kind of a douchebag like music producer got you it. know what I mean and then and then she wound up staying there yeah, in Europe did. and being like you know what screw this guy like I'm gonna do my thing and she did that and that's why she had been gone from family so long but also like it was kind of a shitty relationship so she was she was really like I didn't want to be with anybody she right. just wanted to do her own thing and like you know her sister obviously with her happy family was like I, I just it, it really hurt right you know there was a lot going yeah. there was a lot of layers and probably none of that ever showed up I love and if it, it did it was probably in the episode where I argued with a clown because <laughs> God knows that was some hard hitting emotional topic I love that I love that notion also that you know, you you have you each had to have you know kind of a journey, right. and I think you know another kind of interesting challenge. And you know, you you were so young, so like whereas like the DJ character, you know, she was like older and like doing like already like tweeny things, right. teeny things, like it's different. And you know, my mom is the middle of three girls. Okay, so whenever I see like a show with like you know three girls, right. or whenever I like meet people who are like one of three girls, like I'm always like, tell me all the things. My mother was the middle child. Okay. And so there's like a huge dynamic also to your character that was right. like so the middle child, <laughs> meaning like in in the most, I think, helpful and appropriate ways for a TV show to inform like right. about birth order and especially like with the dads and like all good. Right. But then I also think about, um, you know, your identities also in real life. In that you were different people. Right. Like you had, I mean, I don't mean to group 
um, M- Mary Kate and Ashley because yes. they were playing one person. You know, right. they were very little. Right. But let's say we had these like three personas. Right. And like, you know, Candace was like, she was Candace. And right. then like, they were like the little ones. And then here you are, and you're really like, also in terms of like the public eye, like you are, you're like that middle child because right. it's like, look, let so me, tell me, tell me what it was I, like to sort of like play the middle child, but also feeling even in your like celebrity presence, you were the middle child. I have a great middle child story from Full House that is literally, it is, it was unintentional, but is completely the epitome of middle child moment. Mm. So there's an episode in Full House where Jesse and Becky are moving out of the house. Okay. And, you know, when Jesse moved into the house, yes. he moved into Stephanie's old bedroom. Correct. With the pink bunnies. Mm-hmm. Now, the pink bunnies were supposedly hand cut by Pamela, Stephanie's mom, Jesse's sister, right. and placed on Stephanie's room because when she was a baby, right. that was her room. Yeah. So those pink bunnies were Stephanie's room. Okay. The episode. Where Jesse moves out. Yes. Um, I believe Michelle gives Jesse the pink bunny or vice versa. No, Michelle gives Jesse the pink bunny or vice versa. Something happened. And I was like, wh- wow. But th- those are not, <laughs> not right. like in real life. Like now looking back right. on it, I'm like, but that was like, it's right. just so funny. I was like, oh. What a tr- now I do I actually know what it's like, like to, to be a middle right, child. Right. Well, but it was cuter if Michelle did it. <laughs> right. You know? And the the episode where um where Steph moves into the bathroom. Um I died hysterically laughing because my younger daughter um did that several years ago and like just went and camped out in the bathroom. Um, like brought pillows, blankets, like just went and was like, I like it in here and I'm moving in. And her sister was like, get out of the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was interesting. But um, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, there were definitely those times as an only child, I really was like, oh, so this is the in-between experience, mm-hmm. you know? And, and um it was fun to have that faux family, but it, not going to lie, it was nice to be able to go home as an only child and be like, I just have to be me to worry about. You right. Know? It's interesting because, you know, we just we lost Leslie Jordan recently, mm. you know, from our show. And oh. um, it's, you know, very, very interesting to try and he was in the first commercial I was in. Wow. What was it for? It was a uh, oh, my gosh. Was it? The Sizzler or the Oscar Mayer commercial? I mean, these are two I, excellent choices. Excellent choices. <laughs> and I'm trying to remember whichever the, but I, I, anyway, it was one of those. And he played, I, I actually wasn't in it, in my scene with him. Okay. But for ever, like almost my entire career, every time I would see Leslie Jordan, the, would think not the first thought was like, oh my God, there's this man who's had this amazing career, who is a genius and right. I love, but was like, oh, that was for my commercial. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like as like a little kid, that sense right. of like, you know, it's all about me sort of. No, I get it. But yeah, um, I loved well, him. Ugh. No, he was he was a really very special so man. Um, thank you. But you know, the thing that's like hard to kind of, articulate without sounding like a crazy Hollywood person, and I think you'll totally get it, is like, I wish there was a different word for the kind of family that's created on a set, because it's not a family in the sense of like, it's not your family, meaning you don't share family trauma, you don't share, you know, holidays, (laughs) or you don't share like people in common that like, oh, aunt, whatever, you know, you don't share a a rhythm of a calendar where it's like, when are we going on, when am I going to see my cousins? It's not that kind of family, but it is, it feels as you know, as connected and not in like a Hollywood way of like, oh my God, we all love each other. But like we spent, you spent more time with the people at work than right. you did with your home family. Yeah. And you know, honestly, I look at it like we did, we would plan vacations together. Our, we would go, our, our teachers would plan like field trips for us because we'd always miss out on the field. So like, you know, my school field trips were with them and yeah. we would go and we'd go on location and we'd go travel together or... You know, I grew up and I spent a lot of time with Bob's daughters. I would go spend a weekend at his house and we'd all go to John's and his sisters were always there and his mom and dad. We all knew each other's families. Our families would get together for, you know, weddings, funerals, but celebrations, holidays, rap parties. So we did know each other's families. We did share, like, I mean, it was, 
right? It was really, really deep. Yeah, with and these people, and I, and also like it. That's an extension of the fact that you start with this working relationship that's very intense right. and you're with each other. And I know, you know, when I was acting and, you know, there are hours that you're allowed to work when you're little, right, right. but still you're spending like most of your waking hours. Like mm -hmm. these are often the first people you see in the morning. Right. They're the people that you, you know, have breakfast with, you have lunch with, you sometimes have dinner even, They're you know, and if it's a late night. They're the people that you work with when you don't feel well. Totally. And when They're the people that you, you're sick as a kid right. who, uh, who have to take that in. Like they are the people who you know, are around you every day as totally. a kid. Like they are. Well, and I think also for, for people like you and me who like literally spent like formative years, yeah. you know, those were the people that it's like different. knew me when I, you know, was a kid mm -hmm. and then watched me like become a teen or a yeah. tween. Like they're part of your life. And yeah, you know, it's almost like the way that I kind of think about it is like if you have distant family that you see a couple times a year right, or right. once a year, you know, they can be like, oh my God, you grew so much. But with your set family, no one really notices that stuff because you're together all the time. Meaning right. you're just all growing right. together. Right. You're all, there's there's none of that like, you know, people would sometimes ask like Ted Wass, you know, who played my dad yeah. on Blossom, like, what was it like to watch the kids grow up? And he's like, it was like watching my own kids, kids grow, grow up. They right. were there were all like, the time. Oh my God, what, <laughs> right, you're like, or yeah. you, with the be the the crazy part was I remember when we would come back from hiatus. That That's was the one that I was like, tell. oh my god! Like you know, and it wasn't like hiatuses were really long. It was maybe two and a half months, six Still weeks, eight though. weeks. And you know, kids. If you had kids on a show, man, they yes. come back and they're they're like. You know, we'd come back to the show and the kids had like totally, you know, their voices had changed and their, yeah, <laughs> puberty had happened. We're like, oh my God, now what? It All happened. the ideas for this, this, right. this show don't work. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down. You might feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up the way you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything that life throws at you. Therapy's been a game changer for me and Jonathan and BetterHelp is a great option if you're thinking of giving therapy a try and starting to unpack some of your feelings, your emotions, looking at your childhood or looking at what's going on right now. BetterHelp is convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. Mind Alex Breakdown is supported by Helix Sleep. I've been sleeping well because of this Helix mattress for a long time. I do have sleep issues, but Helix has fixed so many aspects of my life and my sleep, and I'm so grateful to them. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that has tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup has 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. But my kids like sleeping on mine, and so I got them adult mattresses. Everyone sleeps differently. That's why Helix has several different mattresses to choose from, each designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. I'm a midnight person. I'm a twilight. But both of our mattresses are a major upgrade from our last ones. I sleep every which way, even the ways you're not supposed to. Helix does not make my body hurt, and that's so important. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. And I have to say, I love these pillows. Go to helixsleep.com slash breakdown with Helix. Better sleep starts now. Jonathan, are you doing okay over there? Do you need anything? Uh, that's very sensitive of you, Jody. I appreciate that. I want to check in on you and make sure I know that mine doesn't listen to you. <laughs> so um, I just want to be your new favorite, really. Finally, I feel seen. <laughs> I feel heard. Mm -hmm. I feel accepted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about your, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your kids because I believe we all have a child born the same year. You have a child born in 2008. I have an 08 and, an, and a 10. Okay. So I have a 05 and an 8 and he has an 08. So we all share That's a true. 14 the or 15 year The only time I ever hear that this like 08 is in reference to my kids' soccer teams. When they're like, <laughs> oh, they're an, they're an 08, like because it goes by what year they're born. So yes. Yeah. So we're building a soccer so team. So you have two girls. I do. You have two 12 girls. 12 and 14. You are just in it, is my guess. <laughs> I am. 
seventh and ninth grade. And you know, oh, no. I have to say those were both horrible years for me. Just want you to know. I mean, they they were hard and horrible years for me and yeah. for most people too. But I will say, my ninth grader is in a much better position than she was. I think in middle school, and and my younger one is just kind of in the thick of it now. Mm-hmm. I feel like seventh grade just as a rule is like really, yeah. really terrible. Um, I remember very, very few redeeming things about my seventh grade year. <laughs> like it was the first year of middle school. It was just constant bullying yeah. and harassment. And like everyone was terrible. We were terrible to each other. We were terrible to teachers. We were terrible to our parents. We were just terrible. And mm-hmm. thank God we made it through. Right. But I see it now. Um and I would say I have apologized to my mom more <laughs> in the last couple of years than I have ever in my entire life. Right. I just call my mom. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Oh my god, I had no idea. You're right. This was. This is. You. You're right. You did know. I thought you didn't know. You knew. Mm-hmm. I know. They don't know that I know. Right. <laughs> She's like, mm-hmm. it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> um, and you live in L.A. I mean, the L.A. area. Yeah, yep, OK, yep. so you um, you're raising them in L.A., which also is its own. And people are like, well, if you don't like it, get out. And it's like, I thought I don't like it. It's just like it's very different from raising children. I think many other places. Absolutely. Look, city kids are city kids are different than 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 suburbia kids yeah. and and I say that having sort of had a foot in both yeah I grew up in Orange County in like suburbia land like very very normal right. outside of LA childhood blue collar working parent you know like that was m- my upbringing but then also had this foot in like this really sort of weird fun over the top right. like you know LA, a- LA right. experience so I do know that it it is different. And I do know that my growing up in Orange County was a different experience than growing up than my kids here in L.A. But by that same token, I know that so much of my experience growing up here in L.A. and growing up in this business and being exposed to so many different people um, really helped shape me into the person that I am today. And so... In that regard, I do feel like my kids still have that experience of just the the world is very big around them. Right. And sometimes that's a, a terrible thing and sometimes that's a great thing. Um, and unfortunately, these days, I don't know that any of us are safe from some of the scary yeah. stuff that happens, whether you're in a city or a suburb. So, um, totally. you know, there's some of that that you just kind of go, I, I guess, you know, some of it has to is just kind of the world that they live in now. But I love that my girls have had this experience and, um, you know, they they have grown up in ways and around people and experiences, I think, that um, are going to really serve to make them interesting people later yeah, in life. Yeah, for know? sure. Um, the other thing I wanted to, you know, mention something Jonathan and I talk about a lot, you know, there's... Being a parent is like its own, like, what? Um, <laughs> it's its own journey. And yeah. mostly, I really feel like I wish someone had told me, like, hey, guess what? Everything you didn't work out from your childhood. Right, right, When right. you have kids, you're going to have to go through it, like, right. to the nth degree mm-hmm. with, like, a time limit and with someone shouting at you and throwing food at you. Right, like, right, everything right. comes up. Yeah, yeah, and- yeah. It's going to be, you get to learn how to how you wish you would have been parented right <laughs> you get to learn how helpless your poor parents were <laughs> you know right. and how overwhelmed they were and right yeah. well and i you know i can't help but like think about the timeline your kids are about the age you were when full house kind of was ending am i doing mm-hmm. the math right yeah, yeah yeah um and also you know a lot of the challenges that you've been incredibly brave about in talking about and incredibly helpful, I think, to so many people in being open about a lot of those things, you know, for you did start to kind of like bubble and simmer when you were their age. And I wonder, um, you know, do you feel like you have special like protective insight, you know, about those years for them, you know, or do you have fears about it? Because like for me and I think for Jonathan as well, it's like a combination of like when we get to like big milestones or things that were hard. It's like part of me is like, oh, but I don't have to live it again. But then it's like, oh, but I kind of do. Right. (laughs) I I mean, that's the terrifying part as a parent. I think that the realization that your heart now lives outside of your body and um, actually conducts its business completely. (laughs) 
completely separate from you and really doesn't ask you if it's okay, um, but is fully capable of breaking you um, without any of your input. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's what parenting is in a lot of ways. It is trusting your heart to be outside of your body and just hoping that nothing goes wrong. You know, I'd like to think that because of what I've been through, uh, I have uh, the ability to see it coming quicker. I ha- My kids are going to n- realize and know better. Um, I- I- I'm going to be more aware because I worked in treatment for years. Right. Uh, you know, um, And I have spent enough time in my own sobriety, in my own therapy, um, and in life to know that, unfortunately, none of those things guarantee right. anything. And that if people who got sober could see it coming any sooner in their kids, there would be sure. never any, you know, right. generational families, you right. know, celebrating I always say birthdays that to together at a, at a 12-step meeting. I always <laughs> say that. I'm like, if we had figured out, forget about sobriety, like, if, if we just, had figured right. out parenting, we wouldn't have to fight about it. Like, right, the, right, right, the fact right. that There any, wouldn't be 9,000 books. Right. Over, like, right. the fact that anyone, including myself, you know, the fact that anyone might feel at any point certain that they know what to do with anyone right. else's child, the only time you know what to do with someone else's child is when you don't have children then you know everything i know then god so i knew easy. so much i knew so much and you know I, like i got my degree in elementary education i was gonna be a teacher and so i worked in classrooms and stuff when i had graduated college and let me tell you man other people's kids they love you they listen to you i mean not all of them but yeah. but a, a majority of them there's it's because kids don't want to listen to little, their parents right get those same kids at home with their own parents yeah. and it my kids and I'm like, what? Oh, I used to take my kids to my friend Nancy's house so he would eat a vegetable. Right, yeah. If Nancy put it in a soup, it was like sent right. from God. Yeah, I yeah, try yeah. and put it in the same it's soup. Terrible. I don't like this it. This is shit. Right, right, right. It's dog food, right. mama. I don't like it. There. Right. <laughs> it's always someone else. But, you know, I, I, the one thing I have, for better or worse, always um, – said that I want to be with my kids is honest um, and open. And so, you know, while there are not, there are lots of details about my story and who I am that my kids don't know, there are lots that they do know. And, you know, my daughter actually told me the other day that um, she's like so grateful that she and I have such an open relationship and that she tells me everything, which probably means she doesn't tell me everything, but she tells, <laughs> but that means she might tell me a good portion. And right. I tell her, I know you're not going to tell me everything. Mm-hmm. And I make sure that there are people in her life that she trusts, that I trust, that she can go to, you know, whether they're my parents or my best girlfriends or my husband or whatever, so that she knows, like, look, sometimes mom doesn't have all the answers. And I will tell my kids that, like, look, I don't know. I'm doing my best. I realize that may not make you feel, like, super great, but I'm just trying to figure it out, too. Yeah. Well, I think that's so helpful. It's one of the things, you know, that... Um, I, I think is a foundation of a, a really healthy dialogue, you mm-hmm. know, for, for kids to know, like, I'm not, I'm not perfect, you know? And many of us were raised with this notion of like, father knows best or mother right. knows best. And like, and in many cases that, that does make you feel secure. Cause like, oh, they know. Right. But then like, my, my but then you feel betrayed cause that. you're like, they didn't know. <laughs> no, this is a good one. Oh, so yes. I grew up, well, my parents, uh, my parents are from uh, the Bronx. Okay. It's in New York. It's a place. And oh, I know they're the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, It's where the Yankees are from. Yes, um, yes. So I grew up with this, it wasn't even a belief. It was a truth. Right. That stores were closed on Sundays. Okay? Just all stores. That was, right, right, right. Everything's closed. Closed, closed Everything's closed on Sundays. So my whole life was kind of geared around like, we did things during the week or like on Saturday. I didn't grow up observing the Sabbath. We, right. we grew up, I grew up kosher. It's a long story. Anyway, everything's closed on Sundays. And- I start like going out into the world doing things being a human and um turns out things are not closed on Sundays. They're, they're not. They're not. But in the 1940s and 50s in New York things were closed on Sundays. Right. It was called Blue Laws and right. there's still a district of New Jersey where actually I filmed my movie where things are closed on Sundays. Yes. However, that, that's only true in this like one region of New Jersey. That's right, right, not right. where my parents were from. They had never been to that part of New Jersey. But so the this thing, technically wasn't a lie. But it, it was at right. a point no, some truth. But this but it, that, right. But that to me, like that's even what's funnier right. is that like, 
there was no need for anyone to ever look into anything because things are closed on Sundays. So here I am like right. spending my whole life oh, on Sundays. I'm bored. Right. On Sundays, I watch a lot of Twilight Zone. And it's not that they were keeping it from me. There's no maliciousness in this. Right, right, right. It was just, but it was just like that was my life oh, is that things are closed on Sundays. I wish someone to, I wish someone could t- tell me now that things were closed on Sundays <laughs> and I'd believe it. And I just, tell I, I mean, to be honest, home. I don't leave my house much on these days anyway. What am, who am I kidding? But that's a great example of like, right. We could, I mean, sure, there was no Google, but I'm sure we could have asked someone. Right. Is this a rule in California? In California, three thousand right. well, miles no, from that's... where my parents were raised. But what it is, it, what what happens is that it becomes, it, and, you, and then you go, "No, my parents said," and then you okay. get into an argument at school. Yeah, then and you then end gets, up in right. therapy at sixteen. Look, who, <laughs> you waited till you were sixteen? Oh, how lucky! No, I look. <laughs> I first of all, I think everyone needs therapy. I, I it's it is I. It, You're right. Oh, I love Especially my therapist. Me. Espe- <laughs> oh, thank God for therapy. I I like I, I love my therapist. What do you and love I, about therapy? You know what my therapist said to me recently. She said, um, and and it sort of ties into being a parent yourself. Is she said that parenting is learning how to reparent yourself. And it's learning how to be the parent that sh- that you needed to show up for you, uh, in good ways and 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 bad, like right. in all of the ways that you know maybe didn't happen, uh, and that there's nothing wrong with your parents, and it's okay that they did things wrong or different or different. <laughs> right, right, right. That it that. It doesn't make you a bad person for then talking about it and being like, that kind of fucked me up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because I think that's like, there's so much, we have this weird parental thing tied into like, oh, I can't, I don't want to like think that I did that they did a bad job. They didn't do a bad job, you know? And, but yet at the same time, like, I know, right? I'm, and I'm very open about it. I go, look, you guys, I say this to my kids, I go, you are going to need therapy. I know it. <laughs> Not because I'm a terrible parent, but because I am a parent. A human, yeah. And that's why. Do you think that our experience, because I have a very, like, that's a very similar script to what's in my head. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if, if there's something about also growing up in the industry where kind of like, everyone was my parent, meaning I was sort of in a situation where I was really constantly sort of like monitored and protected right? and, and just like more monitored and hopefully protected. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a very, thank God, I had a very positive experience. As, as did I. Yeah, and I so think like I, I, people were like, did you hate it? I was like, no, no I you're loved set, it. Yeah, and I but think, I know not everyone had that. No, and but I know, I know I your set. Yeah, I think your set was known to be a very clean set and ours yes. was as well, meaning I, some people grew up watching, like people were doing like drugs and right, drinking right, at right. work and like no, I didn't no, no. see any of that. No. But even so, like it was kind of always like someone was watching you right. know there like, was a there was a studio teacher yeah there was a, or just like a pa somebody. or an ad right. like someone was always like if i had to pee it was like okay well I'm, we're gonna like wait outside your door make right. sure like you come right back out and i'm wondering though if that also like it's like we had this like uber parental like everybody was our parent so there's this notion that like if i speak badly everyone's gonna hear like it feels like the audience is bigger in my head maybe well i think also that was something that was at least in my house and not in a and not in a bad way like that my but as a reality of growing up in this business what my mom always reminded me of and i can't imagine it these days but what my mom would always remind me is people are watching you yeah oh that's creepy <laughs> it's true and you know, I knew from a young age that I didn't have the luxury to go out and do stupid things. Or, well, I did. And I and I did. I, right. I, I had the luxury and I did them. But I... <laughs> but you did, we didn't have the ease but that I other kids did. But I didn't have the ease. But I think, it, you know, I grew up with that being the voice in my head of... You just, you know, be just be agreeable. Be and And I heard someone say it to who recently um, that growing up in this business, you're often taught that being agreeable is the most important part of 100%. being on set. Yeah. Um, and I think most people have the opposite expectation of this business that you're taught to be difficult as a child actor. No. You're taught to be, as a child actor, you you know you part of what your job is and what makes you a good child actor is that you're like I will stand here, get I will it say right, my line, I will, yeah, just get, get it, it right. right, just do what's asked the first time, and that's it. None of that, like you know, it sounds sort of whatever, but like that wasn't necessarily a bad thing growing up. Like it was just sort of my experience, sure. and it was like being in class, go pee before you go to school, you right. know, whatever. Um, but. I always knew that my life 
wasn't private. And, you know, the first time I was in a tabloid was, I think, nine or ten years old, and it was completely fabricated. It was saying that I was a problem on set and that Bob was trying to get me fired. And and this was at a time when, like I said, I was very close with Bob's family and his daughters and was spending time with, like, his family on weekends and, like... And so like I remember, really untrue. yeah, and I remember it was Star Magazine, and I remember at like nine or ten years old having to come to terms with and understand the reality of sometimes you don't get to be heard. And that, you know, mm. and and that you just have to continue on regardless of what the external is, that, that you have to just kind of keep going through that. And I don't think... A lot of nine year or ten year olds have to learn that lesson, sure. but I I look at that also as like that idea has served me well in a lot of ways too. But it definitely, I've had to dissect it as I get older. It's made me able to do my job without getting sucked into my feelings. But then when it t- t- comes time to like to like oh what are my feelings? It's like oh, I don't know. Those are those are so locked away right now. <laughs> It's interesting, and I'm I'm sure you get I'm sure you get this a lot more than you should. Meaning, I don't think anyone should ask really anyone this, but I'm I'm sure we both have gotten asked this um, many many times. Um, I was asked it just today. I had a speaking engagement, and you know, someone was like, "Why do so many child actors turn to drugs and alcohol?" And like, I really don't I don't love that question because what I like to point out to people is why do so many humans. That's turn, always what turn I point to drugs out. And, alcohol. and I say, like, right. you know, I went to public school in Los Angeles. I was part of the busing program. Mm-hmm. Like, plenty of kids I were trying up. to fill that God-shaped hole right. with whatever they could. And for some people, it's food. And for some people, but but I yeah. do wanna, I do wanna say, and like, it's not my business to speak for anyone. And also, you know, I've I've known many actors who did not make it, Mm -hmm. you know? I've worked with many actors and socialized with many people who are no longer with us. Mm -hmm. So I always felt like when people ask me that, it's like, it's not for me to speak to their memory or to their families who are grieving for the rest of their lives, you know, for me to say like, well, my parents did this and that's why, or like, or even to be like, you know, and for me, my story, happens to be like I'm a second generation American. My parents were very, very strict, but I have no idea really Mm -hmm. the intricacies of anyone's human experience. So I would always say, I would always say like, it's much more complicated than that. It's more of a mental health issue and like a crisis of a denial that mental health exists. But when you talk about what you just mentioned, that for me doesn't relate to drugs and alcohol. It relates to just our human experience when we've been through the kind of thing. And this is not specific to actors. This isn't like, ooh, Maya and Jody talking, you know, about right, acting. Right. This is just like we're all under different kinds of pressure. There's pressure in the family. Right. There's pressure outside. If you play sports. Correct. If you're, so you know, whatever. Our if you're a dancer. I mean, uh, yeah. Right. So our experience is absolutely more magnified, more sure. observed. But that pressure of it really is most convenient if you have the fewest needs possible. That happens to a lot of kids. It's just in the industry, it's our go-to. Right. It's It's our go-to. Like, there's literally, we don't get sick days. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like, are you dying? Like, maybe. Well, come in and see if we can get a doctor to come in. Right, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I remember, like, I, I, um, I've had. But to this day, yeah, taking a sick day is for like I have to be, yep, <laughs> n- crawling, Craw- near dead crawling, and only with the pandemic did I finally go. You know what? Take a sick day yeah. because a, it's not worth it, and b, like no one wants your sick ass around. No. Go stay home. You know what I mean? But it was yeah. that. That felt Tower like program. it was so, that was just a part of like you just you don't ha- you don't get to take a sick day. Well, and also it, it reminds me of when we talk to people who grew up, you know, who people who grew up in alcoholism or with active addiction in their homes. Like, there's often not room to have needs right. because it's like it's always about who who else, and that's really what it's like to be a kid on a set. Even if you're the star of the show, that's what it's like. Like, what do you need? What does he need? Okay, well, there's not room for me. It's also um, did I just compare being on a sitcom to growing? up in alcoholism you did I didn't you mean did it, and then, but I just meant like having having to take into account everybody else's needs because they're important that's called codependence yeah mm. no uh, 
<laughs> title of my this own because I have none. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Here's the thing, sort of tying all of it together. I, I too say the same thing about addiction and um, and growing up in this business. You know, I grew up. Um, again, went to a public school, had lived in a great neighborhood with, you know, great schools and great education and parents all had jobs and all, you know, families living together and quote unquote, you know, happy families, whatever you want to call it. And there were kids in my neighborhood that OD'd and died in their homes and that, you know, that went to jail and that went and had their own struggles with addiction and that wound up on the streets. But the other, you know, five or six kids in my neighborhood, you don't hear about them. But you hear about me because people grew up watching me. Yeah. So much like what you said, I don't know that it's necessarily I, – I, it's hard to gauge, right? It's hard to say, does this affect child actors or people who have grown up in this business more? Or do we just know about it because every time it happens to one of those people, we hear. So it seems like it's more often. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, also – is it the personality type that's drawn to doing this? Great question. Is it the, you know, the personality type of a kid that makes it, that does well in this business is a kid that probably has a little touch of ADHD and maybe a little like neurodivergent. Little narcissism. But maybe, maybe either a little narcissism or, ex or the opposite and extreme people pleasing. Right. And codependency and all of these things that, as a kid, makes for a good actor. Don't you don't necessarily. They're not. As a kid, they're not yet maladaptive practices. Mm -hmm. They're just who you are, and and then you grow up and you go, oh, I let those things. I never learned how to like unlearn some of those things, mm -hmm. but I don't think that it's because I was on. TV, I think that was who I was anyway, but that, you know what I mean? It's like this, Fascinating. you can't pull them apart, I don't think. I think the person that I was made me interested in entertainment. I think entertainment at a young age shaped who I became. I think who I became was, you know, w the path I was on anyway, but also, you know, largely shaped by a lot of weird things that happened growing up. So, you know, it's... It is, we're complicated personalities and child actors are, you know, we're a little different. Well said, really. I, I honestly, I'll, I'll be honest, I've been talking about these things. I mean, I'm 47, so, you know, I've been acting, you know, I started Blossom when I was 14. You know, I don't know if I've had this level of analysis and camaraderie mm -hmm. around this. You know, I'm always very nervous to say, like, I'm always very nervous to like blame the industry on problems right. that we might have, but also like very, you know, very reluctant to also be like, I made it out because also like, you don't like people don't know. The reason, you know? honestly, the reason that this, we started talking about this because I was talking about therapy and only in the last maybe year or so have I really started going like, oh wait, I get to pick this stuff apart and, and, and realize that life is that gray area, right? Nobody has a perfect childhood. Mm -hmm. Nobody has a perfect experience. And there are also great things that happen in terrible circumstances, right? And all of those shades of gray are true. And until I'm willing to look at the pluses and minuses and the gray areas mm -hmm. of all of the things of my life, I don't think I can really adequately get down to the bottom of the shit that I need to mm -hmm. until I can go, oh, that was kind of good, but that kind of was a weird, but that was awesome. You know, like, that's mm -hmm. life. It's all very complicated. And, you know, I, I think remembering that and p pulling those things apart without feeling that guilt and the right. shame and feeling like I had a wonderful experience. I still struggled with addiction. I don't think it was entirely the business's fault, mm -hmm. but there was a layer of it. Do you share your sobriety date or your current sobriety? <laughs> or even roughly speaking, like, you know, I, like I, are you a toddler? I, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm double digits. Okay. Um, I'm double digits. And I... Um, are you a teen? Not I, yet. No, not, you're not old enough to be a teen. No, no, not, not yet. Okay, no. so you're a, you're a kid. You're still, you're like, and, you're you in know, elementary school and trying to get to junior high. Right. And, you right. know, and I will say, like, recovery looks a lot different these days than, um, than it did in the beginning. And I think that for me, my experience and my practice of 
of sobriety of of twelve step principles and programs, um, and what that looks like for me. Like it's changed a little bit over the years, but sure. it is still the through line that like I try and you know practice these principles in all, all my affairs. affairs because I learned to just be a much better human. Yeah, and I find myself to be a better human today. Um, because I still look at how I can, what is my part in things? How do I, you know, can I keep my side of the street sure. clean? If I, you know, fuck something up, can I go back and That's be like, a, yeah, I blew a it. Step. How do I make this better? You know, right. It's a 10 step that we can do every night, right. you know? You know, when we talk about like our personalities when we're little and especially, you know, thinking of you starting so young and, um, you know, as someone who started late. I mean, I was considered late and people think that's ridiculous until right, right. I like talk to people like you who like literally like it's what you know. Like right. for me, I had like a normal. Like, right. I mean, it wasn't so normal. But yeah, I had like a I had my version right. of normal. A, a normal. Um, right. A normal but, messed um, up childhood. <laughs> you know, I, I do. I want to ask a little bit um, when you talk about, you know, your mom and dad. So I didn't know this about you. So you were adopted. Yes. As a little tiny one. As a little tiny one. And, about, um, a year, little over a year old. Okay. And you were raised by, is it your uncle? No. Well, okay. <laughs> so it's my, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, it sometimes requires a diagram, but I'll okay. do my best to, uh, <laughs> so, and I talk about it in the book. Um, mm -hmm. and my adoptive parents, my mom and dad, mm -hmm. Sam and Janice. Okay. Sam's ex-wife. Okay. His ex-wife is my biological dad's yes. aunt. Oh, okay. So my Got adopted it. dad's ex-wife is my biological great aunt. Got it. And my so, dad has three kids with her. Okay. So technically they are my cousins yes. by blood, and my half-siblings right. by adoption. Right. So basically but you But they were, were all like adults, yeah, but yeah. my dad's much So older. you were essentially adopted into extended family. Is kind of how it sort, is. Yeah, exactly. Right. It, and it was, yeah, it was, you know, there were connections there and it was, you know, I, I and I was fortunate that I did not have to, uh, that I, and I, I had family that, you know, had brought me home from the hospital um, when I was an infant, not my, my adopted parents, but, uh, you know, other family mm -hmm. and friends that had taken me home. You know, I, I was lucky that I didn't wind up um, in the system and yeah. that I did have people Were that stepped in. Were you born in the system? As I it was. was. I was wow. born uh, in L.A. County Jail. In L.A. County. Well, I mean, technically I was born at USC County Medical Center. But, okay. Uh, but but yeah. as part of the, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm just being honest. I don't know that I've ever spoken to someone, you know, who, no, who was, who was really part of the system like yeah. that. Um, yeah. And then my, yeah, my, um, my biological dad uh, was actually in uh, Soledad State Prison when I was young, mm -hmm. um, which was a reason that other family had to take me home as well, um, and that it was family on his side. But he was in prison um, and was actually uh, stabbed and killed in a prison riot uh, mm -hmm. when I was about nine months old. Wow. And um, so, you know, it's... Did you know your bio mom? No, I did not. Wow. Um, and... It wasn't ever anything that was kept from me, but it sure. was something. And I think, honestly, as, <laughs> again, the healing that happened as I got older and became a mom yeah. and suddenly had this different understanding of what what being a parent is and what being a mom is and a human being mm. and experiencing all of those things, um, the amount of forgiveness that I had for my biological mom mm -hmm. was huge mm -hmm. and uh, really l like life changing. You know what we know about the the prison system, which many of us have talked about for many, many years, or as I've been recently pointing out, the hippies were talking about in the 60s and everyone was like, you're crazy, you're on right, drugs. Right. Well, guess what? Prison reforms um, has been around. Exactly. Probably, if you look at Victorian time, you know, Co correct. Reform, like, there's that, been... you're like, it's so weird. It's like <laughs> the same things happening correct. for like 200 years. But what we know, you know, yes. about um, a huge percentage of people, um, you know, who struggle with mental health challenges or who are often um, products of abuse, yes. you know, who end up in 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 a system that then places an extraordinary amount of psychological pressure, and it, in many cases, it's, I'm just gonna say it's torture. 
You take traumatized individuals, Correct. you put them in further traumatizing situations, and then you wonder why <laughs> they traumatize people when they get out in environments right. that are conducive to trauma. And then people, and then you throw more money at traumatizing them on the back end instead of preventing it from happening in the first place. But that's where Ooh. we're at. But I do no. I, I mean, I'm yeah. not. I'm not dismissing it. Like no, no. It's you know, something when that I, I'm really passionate. No, about and when today. I when I sh I showed my kids the 13th, the Ava yes. DuVernay, um, you know, documentary, mm -hmm. and it was like. Um, um, you know, first of all, it was shocking to, I mean, there, I, I showed it in an age appropriate, you know, fashion, right. but you know, the notion like of, of educating kids and saying like, this is not new, like this has been going on and it's a, you know, a continue, but I'm just, I'm sort of interested because as we think about sort of how we end up, you know, the way we end up and like the mm -hmm. path that we take, um, you know, and obviously it sounds like your parents did a really a, a really one. I mean, I think you're amazing. Thank you. And um, my parents, my did... mom and dad, like are, and I think about it all the time. Like, yeah, they really they they took on something um, and a, a situation and a kid that needed it. Yeah. And my parents have been the most amazing mom and dad. I mean, they have yeah. stood by me. You know, when I've really, 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 really pushed them right. to the limit. Well, and I guess that was sort of my question because you know, obviously, we're a product of so many things. Mm -hmm. But I do wonder, and I'm sure this is part of, you know, the work that you get to and that we all get to keep doing when we go to therapy. You know, do you do you think about sort of, you know, what we come from in terms of, you know, there's there's a lot that is nurture. There's a lot that is nature. Um, you know, when people are like, oh, is this and, you know, as a sciencey person, people ask me, like, well, is this, you know, is this like, it. is this inherited? Is it? And I'm like, well, here's what's inherited. Coping mechanisms, the way people talk, the way people act. And right. also you do get, you know, but a that's genetic also shaped by right. Exactly. Like you can't. It's so do you do you think about that? Or I'm, I mean, I'm sure when you were I'm sure when you were a, a teen and when you were kind of like starting to struggle, we don't always make those connections. Well, by the time I was 15, I knew that I, like, I drank differently than other people. I knew I was already, I knew I had an issue with addiction. I just knew it made me feel different than other people. And I've always been pretty self-aware. You knew that you drank differently than other right. people. You knew that you came from kind of like a history of that. But also, that's not necessarily, and what people don't understand, it, it, this is not really, it's not a choice-making process right. that we undergo. It's right. a very, especially when your brain is still developing. And, you right, know. right, right. So I was just kind of curious. I would imagine that at that young age, you may not have realized, like, I think I'm repeating patterns right. that might have been, you know. <laughs> well, and I look at it now, you know, and I see, I'm like, oh, you know, oh, some attachment issues, right, right. Um, some, you know, things that I that I didn't uh, realize I had until I was like, why is it that like, you know, my relationships are failures? Why is it that this is happening? Why, you know, and be, and I think. And, and I was as an adoptee and as someone who is now much more vocal about that experience, I think one of the things that happens um, with adoptees is that we discount ourselves and think, well, all that happened before I remember. Right. You know what I mean? Like that was like the first year of my life. Like what the hell was it? You know what I mean? Like the body, all the rest of it was fine. The body keeps score. The body keeps the score. Such a great book. Right. And and I read that book and recommended to me by my wonderful um, husband who is a therapist and social worker. You know, I read that book and I was like, oh. Oh, yeah. oh, I get it. Like, so again, those what pieces is it? Ex explain it to people who may not know, you know, what, what happens, let's say, for in any not yours, but like right. in anyone's first year, like, what does what happens? Well, basically, I mean, I am in no way a scientist, nor did I write this book, but uh, <laughs> according to my layman's brain and its understanding, you know, in the first year of life, you are forming um, all those important connective uh, responses. You know, it's the reason that Reese's monkeys will cuddle, you know, a, 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 a furry thing that doesn't give them food <laughs> and starve to death over something that feeds them but that is wired. They, they are hardwired to go for something that comforts them even if it is actually detrimental to themselves. So I think... You know, in that first year of life, we are just looking to figure out how to survive, really, in the world. And so, so many of the basic things we learn about how to survive of crying to get attention or, or you know, um, you know that our needs will be met, that we are not alone, that we, you know, all those sorts of things. If there is a disruption in those, and sometimes there is for any period of time, the longer that happens 
the less of those connections are made in the brain. And so then the brain starts figuring out how to find other ways to cope, you know, and thank God the brain is a, a something that is, you know, malleable and, and will change and rewire itself. But those things are still affected, right? So people like me that maybe, you know, I and I talk about the story, I was left alone for a certain amount of time as an infant and I got pneumonia and all sorts of things. Those are things I don't remember, but my body does. And so, you know, for me, living a life long battle with anxiety and depression and all of yeah. those things, um, you know, I had to really stop and look at and reconsider the importance of those things and not use them as an excuse, but allow them to enter. Right, to enter my brain as part of the information of, oh, this is what's affecting me. And, and again, until I look at it, I can't do anything about it. So if I'm constantly going, well, that that's stupid. There's no way that could be it. And how do I know unless I look at it? Right. You know? And so I've been looking at it, and I'm like, I think there's a thing. It's more than the first year. They're showing that it's prenatal, that yes. the child is wired to the nervous system of the mother and that the state of the mother and the emotional state of the mother during the time of pregnancy is actually the first wiring. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, I also wondered, since you were the one who recommended Peter Levine's book to me, which is literally behind me in an unspoken voice over a decade ago. Oh, um, yes. That's also yeah, a book that's right sitting there. on uh, my office bookshelf. Yes. Yeah. Jonathan, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to kind of what Jody just alluded to, you know, like, I, I don't remember that, but my body does. Can you speak kind of from a somatic perspective about either your experience with that as a, you know, as a practitioner person or just as a person who's done that kind of body work? You articulated it perfectly. There's a whole set of influences that most people are not aware of that are shaping how they experience the present. Mm -hmm. And most of us are like, if I don't remember it, it doesn't exist. But our precognition, our pre-memory, even in utero, mm -hmm. we are discovering that our experiences, our connection to the, to a caregiver, our um, pre-birth, right. the well, I mean, the way mother's that we're voice, in, all of that they've studied, the yeah. Mother's voice is the mother experiencing the, her own trauma mm -hmm. while that then right. gets passed, those hormones get passed to the baby. And then everything... Like even you, you could take it even further that it's not only about the um, pre-memory years. There's lots of stuff that happens to us now that we don't remember. I mean, absolutely. All kinds of trauma that doesn't that I'm, you know, will happen and go, oh, my God. You know, that's it's not always a fun experience when that comes back. I don't want to get too deep into this because I do want to finish like. And were Jody you finished, specific? Jonathan, by the way? I'm so sorry. It's OK. Keep going. Oh, see, I. I'm trying to get never better gonna, at remembering. I am not gonna never going to hear the end of this. I'm sorry. Now no, I've he made loves you look bad. I should a little just bit. leave now. Hold it's on. Okay. I'm going to go work this out in my therapy <laughs> I'm just, session. I'm just wondering. I need to speak Joe, to your husband. We have a couple of uh, episodes coming up. Would you like to just sit in and moderate for us? <laughs> she's our guest co-host to keep. The she's only good reason at this. is because I've been trying to get better at doing it myself. Thanks she is therapy. a desirable yeah. co-host on many <laughs> reputable talk shows because Why, of you. she's good at this. Thank you. She's, we've never had such a conscientious, attentive, aware. I am just living my best dependent <laughs> life right now. No, tell me more. No, I'm just kidding. No, I was going to say, I, I don't feel, I don't want to get like too deep because right. there's a couple more things I want to talk about that are specific yes. to you. But when we talk about the things that we choose to remember and mm -hmm. the things we choose to forget, yes. as a female person, I know that I definitely have accused and yes, this is a gendered statement. I'm just saying it. I've accused more men than women in my life of not remembering things that I cannot believe they don't remember because they have real emotional significance to me. And I also know that there are things that like I don't remember that literally happened. Right. So there's this notion also, and it may be gendered, it may not be, it might have been an unnecessary uh, brooch of topic, but <laughs> the notion also of like, Memory's not so simple. It's not just no. like, I remember it because it happened. And well, then the things no. that happened that I don't remember don't affect me. It's 
so much more your complicated. Mem- your memory is based on your perception. You see the world how you've experienced the world. So, you know, a scenario that looks to you one way is going to look d- a completely different way to another person, which is why witness testimony is a mess and wearing all this kind right. of stuff. Yes. What are each of your earliest memories? I remember preschool. I uh, Yeah, I, I remember like preschool I mean, a, things. I a couple things. I remember... Oh, I can. I, I mean, I can smell the grape, um, the 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 juice that was served at my <laughs> preschool. Like smells. I mean, are right. obviously always very important. But like, oh, I can smell it oh, even when it's not there. I have an early one, and it's not something that there's a photo of. That's okay. I always check because that was a really good point you made. Like sometimes we remember things because people told us about them, right. or there's pictures, or we're on right. television for a number of years. Right, right, right. No, I have a memory of playing with, um, what's that like uh, kind of goopy, it's not Play-Doh, but it's that goopy stuff that you play with in preschool that's made of like cornstarch and flour and water. Oh. Uh, Gek. Gek. Gak. 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 I love that Scott was like more right. certain than anything it, he's ever been like, certain of that that's right, gag. Right, right. Like basically, it's like you touch slime. it and it, it, you touch it and it moves, but yeah, then you yeah, put it right. down. I remember playing with that. I, I don't really remember like anything else. And then I'm always like, did something terrible happen after that? Like right. I don't know. Right. So remember that. And I remember it was at a preschool. It was at a church. I didn't go to a church preschool, but we rented a space. Right. On. Um, uh, Hollywood Boulevard, east of La Brea, is where my okay. mom uh, said that that memory took place. So that's pretty early. Yeah, I remember. I just the other day had a flash of a memory from preschool of, and again, it started with a smell um, of like it was a classroom, and it, I, mm. I think I walked into one of my kids' classrooms recently for like for a whatever open house, and it was like the smell of old desks and old books and whatever. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I know the smell. Wow. And I instantly flashed to me at a play kitchen, like huh. in the back of this preschool room or maybe, yeah, right. whatever it was. Yeah, I just. Um, I, I want to know if you had to name, let's call it five things. What are five things you would say you do to kind of keep your center? Um, I meditate. What kind of meditation? Uh, whatever is on okay. my phone app. Got and it. I do like it. Like gu- guided meditation. Guided meditation. Okay, great. Um, or sometimes just music at night, theta okay. waves, whatever. Um, Th- hold on one second. Theta waves or theta whatever. Waves. Yeah. What is that? There, it, uh, theta waves are just really good to help calm anxiety. Is it and like your white, brain down. white noise? Similar, yeah. Okay. It's just, it, I don't know. It's a it's neutral even, sound. Exactly. You it's could a Google neutral it. sound. But I also like guided meditations. Okay. I listen to. Oh, um, Jonathan just oh, pulled him up. He apparently has been listening the whole time. I uh, I listen to um, The Prophet by reading by Khalil Gibran Whoa. as I fall asleep or The Velveteen Rabbit a lot. Um, oh. I know, weird. Um, no, lovely. And then. Um, oh, so meditate. It's one of my favorite books as a kid. I didn't Velveteen know Rabbit. That. A, yeah, I have um, I have yep. a, a quote on my wall hanging about the Velveteen Rabbit about um, that become about becoming real and that you're you know once your your eyes have been loved off and your hair worn out and all this. It's oh one of my, my favorite one of my favorite quotes about how becoming real um, doesn't always look pretty on the outside, but it's the best on the inside. So. Uh, okay, so that's t- two things so two far. Things. Meditation. Meditation, reading. Books, right, books um, uh-huh. that you listen to. Um, therapy, it feels like, is reading, a Reading, therapy. Okay, and what kind of therapy do you do? I just do t- talk like therapy. psychotherapy. Just psychotherapy. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. I've tried EMDR. My brain, it, it gets too distracted. And it was also hard because it was during COVID, so it was no, like trying to do time. it online. I just, okay. it was hard. But therapy, reading. Do you are yeah. you a medication person? I am a medication okay. person. Do, would you consider that one of the things? You oh my do? god! Okay, got oh it. no! Okay, so uh, medication. I actually, I, yeah, I would. I would put that probably in the top three. Um, that has been life changing for me. Okay. Um, and I'm a huge advocate for um, getting medication if you need it and mm-hmm. and letting go of that judgment. Um, and then maybe there's only four. Whatever you want. <laughs> And then I'm like, well, no, there's more, there's more than five. I'm like, well, what? No, my family and my dog and my, I mean, my dog's a big one. Okay. I have a dog. I mean, my dog is like, I love my dog and she is big and fluffy. What and does I she just, give you? Cause what's the thing? She gives me absolutely, she, she needs nothing from me. Although she is a needy creature. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I don't have to, uh, she doesn't ask anything of me. Hmm. I don't have to explain myself. I don't have to 
tell her what's going on in my head when it's going so fast I can't put it into words. Okay. I can just lay on top of the dog and pet her big fluffy nice. neck. And that's it's it. comfort. Very much so. Comfort. It's unconditional, unjudgmental um, uh, comfort that is in a way sort of selfish because it doesn't re- it, it's all really self-serving you're like right. petting the dog but you have you, to you, know. you have to like feed the dog and oh my god dog. no i yeah, yeah. the dog is the she dog needs is a couple spoiled. things i mean okay, got it. no the, look the dog what's eats, her name her name is isa oh she is a she's a um shepherd german shepherd husky chow chow mix so she's oh, a big wow. fluffy yeah if i really think about the things that i do 100 percent solely for myself um though i would say those are the things like i just unapologetically like those five things. I love that. Yeah. Um, I have one more question Ooh. before we let you go. I'm wondering um, if there have been times when you just kind of wanted to run away, like just like 10 a.m. To- today. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like I'm thinking, especially to kind of like the harder times, you know, and like, you know, even when my kids were like little, you know, when it just felt like it just everything felt like really unmanageable. And I, you know, I know you've had you, you've had, as you mentioned, you've had relationships. You're mm-hmm. you're currently in what we hope is a happy yes. and beautiful and yes, really we got healthy. Married in lovely. July. It's amazing. Yeah, He's you're you're a just, newlywed. I am. Yeah. He's amazing. And um, I love him. But but, you know, kind of like all of that stuff mm-hmm. aside, like when things were harder, like did you ever have that feeling of just like, I wish I could just like turn it all off and just like start a new anonymous life elsewhere? swear I no joke probably feel that currently at least once a month Hmm. Um, what is it and not because I uh, am ungrateful for my life and not because I don't love what I do or my kids or any of that Um, but I I I oftentimes my anxiety Hmm. my anxiety and depression will get so bad hmm. that, uh, and this is, I'm being very honest about this. My anxiety and depression will get so bad, and it happens definitely uh, at least once to twice a month, that I just, I want a tiny home hmm. in the middle of nowhere. I want no electronics. Mm-hmm. I want to read books and take walks with my dog and do jigsaw puzzles and write in a journal and mm-hmm. like watch whatever the hell I want to watch and like that's it mm-hmm. and I don't and listen to music and that's I want no outside external noise because it's overwhelming sometimes and I I think I feel that way more now than I probably did when I was young mm. and things were uncomfortable I think because now um I'm asking myself to, in response to feeling that way, what do I do? I was going to say, what takes that When you're place? young and you're like, oh, whatever, I just feel that, ah, but, you know, and you're just kind of messy and all over the yeah, place. Just now, feel it. Yeah, just Now, I'm like, I feel it and I go, oh, this requires me t- to reprioritize some things mm. or... Or maybe my boundaries aren't strong enough. Maybe I need to say no to some things or maybe I need to put certain things down and do, you know, and, and, um, I'm one of these days I may just do it and run away (laughs) to my (laughs) tiny home. Um, and if I didn't do it during COVID, which was a really, really hard time for me, I had a real, uh, mental breakdown during COVID, Mm. uh, lost 37 pounds, like just really struggled. I don't do well under stress and and worry. Mm. And, um, I, now when I have those thoughts of running away it makes me question how I can listen to myself to hold better boundaries for myself and um do a little better uh, self-care you know and it's oftentimes I guess to revisit you know that that list um Mm -hmm. you know that we talked about um uh, there's so many things I didn't get to. Um, you you have so many other credits, and I don't know. Maybe you'd come back and play some more Absolutely. another time because also like you have so many fun things that you do, and you know you've you've branched into producing and just like so many so many cool things um, that I didn't really get to to talk to you about. Um, but I do want to say um, 
that you do, you have a podcast, correct? I do. I have a and podcast. And I wanted to give that a special shout out. Yes. Uh, never thought I'd say this, which is... Uh, You're in a, your fifth season? We finished our fifth season. Wow. We are coming back for a sixth that I think is going to look a little bit different. Uh, and I'm also branching out into potentially another podcast. Um, oh, wow. More of a comedy related one. Because um, you also do comedy, which is like its I own the thing I'm terrified of doing. But I um, do, yeah. I just did a show at the comedy store this week. Oh weekend. my gosh. Not that's... Sta- it wasn't pure stand up, it was me and three other stand ups and like a sketches. Panel show, that's but, amazing. Yeah. Wow, that's really awesome. I'd, I'd love to also come see you because yes. sometimes, I, sometimes I leave this room. Yeah. Um, but anyway. I, right, sometimes I do too, but yes. usually. <laughs> No, but we're just, we're so grateful to have you on and we will um, tell everybody many more good things. Um, Jonathan, anything else you want to say before we let this lady go? I'm just ready to post my Velveteen Rabbit uh, (laughs) quote on Instagram. I have it here. Yeah. Oh, read. Will you read it? Will you read it? It's one of my favorites and I'd love for people to listen to it. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes dropped out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby but these things don't really matter at all because once you are real you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand the velveteen rabbit so after the velveteen rabbit made me cry you're welcome i hugged jody goodbye and we kind of did that off camera because i wanted some time to kind of unpack with you so really Really interesting conversation um, that we just had. I don't think I've ever really considered the way she kind of presented that that pressure element. Um, I'm always so quick to say, like, don't look at child stars any different than other people because it's true. Drug addiction, alcoholism, all those things happen to everybody. But the the uniqueness of that kind of pressure it was really interesting to me. I don't know if you resonated. You know, you also come from a family with a lot of, of pressure and you weren't in the public eye. No, but we've talked about the industry and how it breeds uh, an intensity for not having needs. It was covered in the Raven Simone episode, and it was talked about a bit in the Will Wheaton episode, in the Jeanette McCurdy episode also. Um, And there's this, you know, running theme of how that environment is, is a mirror to what we all grew up with, or many of us grew up with, where having no needs is the safest choice. And then what do we give up? What parts of ourselves do we start to get disconnected from? You know, you call me out on this sometimes. You know, I grew up in the aftermath of my brother's accident. And my sister before that was extremely sick and had undiagnosed fibromyalgia and had back surgery when she was 11 and had all these mysterious conditions. So as the kid who had, you know, quote unquote, nothing wrong with him, you you didn't want to make a fuss, but then there was almost a joke in my family that like the kids took turns hurting themselves mm. or being hurt. Like my brother broke his leg. Okay, so now the family is focused on him. And mm-hmm. in the absence of being able to have, and I don't mean to simplify it like this because it's much more complicated, but in the absence of sort of having space for emotions, well, if you're physically hurt, then you're able to get attention or you're able to have a need because then there's something actually wrong with you. Well, not surprisingly, we just went from me asking how you felt about the episode and sort of my reflections on the industry. It went straight. No, no, no. I, but I think it's interesting. It went, it went, it, it, it got even more specific. I was hoping that you would kind of pull something general out of it. Like, oh, all families have pressure. But I think that's really interesting that you used a very specific example um, in your case, because I think that's sort of, That's what I'm, I guess, alluding to. You know, there's all these other elements that we don't realize kind of make us, you know, who we are. And there's also this notion of like, is there enough attention to go around? And I think when you're working on a set, you know, that's one example of like, well, there's clearly, there's a lot of attention, but not necessarily for the things that I need, right? So how can I be of service? How can I help other people? But then also, you know, for you as a kid, when there's, all of that attention not going to you, of course there's a tendency to not want to like make trouble, but there's still a deep need to be seen. And you know what you, you did a lot of uh, covert operations. I think, you know, you did a lot of things privately. You had a lot of sort of um, things that you, you shoved away. You know, it's almost like, look, I hurt too, but no one can know. Does that, I mean, does that sound kind of right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, That need doesn't go away. Even if there isn't an outlet 
that it can be received. So then we start to find ways to express it in in other areas. And I think the extrapolation is that very few families, well, maybe that's an over an exaggeration, but I don't know that many families that had a rich dialogue where the child's internal world got to get explored and mirrored and seen and held and expressed. And, you know, there was a lot of space for processing and teaching emotional vocabulary and the fact that sometimes your body hurts and that can be stress induced. And like that didn't happen where I grew up. I mean, I'm sure there are places where that did. And um, I know people who had maybe parents who had done that type of work, but our parents, you know, grew up in a different generation. They did the best they could. They tried and and provided uh, provided for us um and we also as you begin to have a child and begin to parent you learn oh wait a second there are all these things that we either don't know how to do and i say this often is like you learn more about how you were raised by how you react to your child in pain <laughs> it's true so the choices are how could you do this to me right how could you do this or how can I? What's help? wrong with you? What's wrong Be with quiet. You, right? Stop what you're doing. Stop I, or crying. Or like the level of like internal angst that happens when the child is unconsolable. Or blaming yourself, right? Like, how could I not control this? It's so. I mean, you're so powerless. I remember. Or the what first... are other people going to think? Depending on where you are, right. like that whole range of thinking shows you so much about what was prioritized in your home when you freaked out as a I kid. I don't even. I don't even know if if my ex-husband and I like even knew what the word blame was until we had children. And then all of a sudden it just became a contest of who can blame the other for like, I would find ways to be like, your breathing in the living room woke him for the sixth time. It's like, that's not even true. But you find ways like, well, if you hadn't eaten beans at 4 a.m. yesterday, he wouldn't have, you know, poop now. Like it was it just becomes this gigantic blame game. And it's like that tells or if a me child like, hurts themselves oh, it's or like your, falls your off fault. a jungle gym. <laughs> Miles has a scar. He literally, to this day, he's 17. He has a scar across his nose because Mike literally, like, accidentally scratched it. Like, he was, like, picking him up. And it was just, like, it was this day that, like, whatever. You know, sometimes you forget to trim your nails if you're not a nail biter like me. He shouldn't have been a nail biter like me. And then he wouldn't have scratched our child. And he literally has a scar to this day. It's Mike's fault. I have a question for you that's going to circle back to something you said previously. You talked about the amount of people watching you on set, not just like your performance, but like monitoring you and like, what are she doing? Oh, you have to go to the bathroom. Let me take you there. Let me let me wait outside. Let me make sure you come back. Do not ask what I think you're going to ask. Do not go there. What do you there. think I'm going to ask? Stop it. What do you think I'm going to ask? Stop it. What do you it. think I'm going to ask? What do you think? Stop it. What you're going to you ask if that's why I always want you around watching me do things. That's what I you're was going to ask. No, I was going to ask, what do you think it brings up for you in the absence of that? Do you that's think it asking makes why you... I want you around all the time watching me do things. That's why you wanted me to watch you type your script. Shut Even up. Even though I wasn't helping anymore and you didn't want me searching the internet because you were like, oh, if he just like, you Jonathan, wanted that. Jonathan, what's your favorite thing for me to do with you? I don't know what. Go to the supermarket with you. That's just a good activity. <laughs> but I, 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 we have the same disease. You spot it, you got it. That's what it's called. You spot it, you got All it. All right. And no, that's not why I wanted you to pay attention when I was writing. I wanted you to pay attention because we were in the middle of a writing session and I wanted to have at least a glimmer of hope that we might be able to finish something without you doing seven other things while also making a list of sporting <laughs> activities you need to purchase supplies for for next summer. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, this has been a lot of fun. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD 